Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. It's great to have all of you here in our Lord's house again, as we always gather to offer worship and praise for all that he continues to do for us, especially all the blessings he continually bestows upon us, and that greatest gift of all, his son, Jesus, our Savior. With that, we follow our order of divine services printed out for us. It's also up on the overhead. We begin with our opening hymn, This is the Day the Lord Hath Made. We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let us now confess our sin to God, our merciful Father. Gracious God, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We know well that we are by nature sinful and unclean. Morning, noon, and night, We have done things we ought not to have done, and have not done that which we have been been doing as your faithful servants. We have neglected the salvation you so graciously have provided for us. Indeed, we deserve your punishment in this life and for eternity. Trusting in your mercy, we come to you for forgiveness. Our trust is not in ourselves, but in the merits of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Grant us remission of all our sins and lead us to renewed lives that reflect your goodness, mercy, and love. With confident joy, I announce to you that God is gracious and merciful, and hears our supplications upon your confession by the command of our Lord and his called and ordained servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our hymn of praise.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Grant that be your Holy Spirit, we may always think and do those things that are pleasant in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson for today comes from Genesis chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Hebrews chapter 2. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by the angels provided to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit did Spirit distributed according to his will. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower, while, little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For while it is fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell you of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. This is the word of the Lord. Be we stand and speak the Alleluia verse responsively. Alleluia, Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. The Pharisees came up and in order to test Jesus asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, 
Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. This is the gospel of the Lord. We now confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made being of one substance with the fam, who whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we join in singing Jesus' Priceless Treasure.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our meditation today comes from our gospel reading from Mark 10. It was read a few moments ago from the lectern, Dear Friends in Christ. The question of marriage and divorce is what first meets our eyes when we read this text and we heard it read this morning. To be sure, the Old Testament lesson for today also attests to that. The epistle lesson from Hebrews, however, it adds a new perspective to the text for us to look at. It clearly states that disobedience of God's law has consequences and no violator shall escape any kind of judgment. It also announces our salvation perfected through Christ's suffering and death on the cross where he paid the price for our sin. So in our text today from Mark, Jesus had been teaching and he had been performing mighty works and and demonstrating to those who were crowded around him. And this was a, a, a thing that was going on all the time where Jesus was at. The crowds were all around and he was teaching that the kingdom of God had indeed drawn close. The Pharisees, they've been habitually looking for some way and some opportunity to put Jesus to the test and then to trap him in his own words. The question about divorce and the Mosaic provision for it emerged out of the blue and the Pharisees once again are testing Jesus. But it's not really the question at all. In fact, it's just a smokescreen, if you will, cut from the same cloth as the a, as a number of other questions and challenges that they had thrown at our Lord during his earthly ministry. It's really the same question as when Jesus was asked, by what authority do you do things? Who can forgive sins but only God? Why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why don't your disciples fast like the disciples of the Pharisees? Why don't they wash their hands before they eat? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Which is the greater commandment? Who is my neighbor? What must I do to inherit eternal life? That is the ultimate question. That one right there. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Underlying all of the other questions that they had thrown out against Jesus. Including today's question that they put out there about marriage and divorce. How does one enter the kingdom of God? How does one become right with the Almighty? It's sort of the same question which John the Baptist asked while he was in prison and awaiting his execution. He, he says, are you the one who is coming or do we look for another? In the long run, it is, more, it is a more important question. One with eternal implications. More important than the question about marriage and divorce. For that one, as Jesus well knew, deals only with symptoms. It only deals with symptoms without getting to the heart of the real question. Jesus answers these Pharisees and and comes to them and he says, you receive everything in childlike faith. It's a little play on words here when we look at this. If you look really closely at the text, it shows that this is so, this play on words. When the Pharisees posed their question to Jesus, it's really quite interesting how they did it. They said, is it lawful? Or is it permitted? And this is now referring to the law in their experience, that law of Moses, the Torah, the holy law of God. And they put it out there, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus counters their question then, with his own question. He turns it back onto them and he says, what did Moses command you to do? And they said, Moses allowed. And right there they had ducked the question. Jesus didn't ask, what did Moses allow? He asked, what did Moses command? But that's the difference in how he thinks with how the Pharisees think. To come back on that question with a statement about allowing or allowance. Jesus went on simply as to show that you folks and we folks 
shows that we are all sinners and they were all sinners. As he says, for the hardness of your heart tells us that we are sinners. What Moses commanded in the Torah, we read in the scriptures today in the Old Testament lesson, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. In other words, as Jesus went on in this discussion and in this situation, what God has joined together, let man not separate, he says. To do so, no matter what Moses allowed for the hardness of your heart, is sin. It's breaking what God has specifically commanded. To show that this is so, Jesus went on in actual terms of the Ten Commandments then and used its language, adultery. Let's call it what it is, he said, and let's get it down to basic sin against God. Just as the Sermon on the Mount, he called out lust of the heart of adultery and equated hate with murder and, and, he, and he insulting someone else, he said, with slander and taking an oath uh, um, of any unnecessary or, or deceitful kind of anything as taking God's name in vain. Let's call it what it all is. It's sin. And we need to stop referring it to anything else. It is sin. Right after this incident, then, in Mark's gospel, our gospel lesson for next week, we'll hear about the rich man. The rich man comes, whom eventually Jesus tells him to sell everything and give it all to the poor. And when the, the man balked at that, he turns away from Jesus and walks away. And Jesus went on with his famous saying about it's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than, than getting someone rich into the kingdom of heaven. This in turn then led the disciples, not the Pharisees who kept ducking the issue, but the disciples to finally ask the ultimate question then in verse 26, then who can be saved? How does a person enter the kingdom of heaven then? He tells them, as we heard a little earlier, you receive it like a child. We've actually misunderstood and misinterpreted these words by equating them with childlike faith, which, by the way, the Bible says we are urged to grow out of and to move away from childlike faith and move into adult-like faith. You receive the kingdom of God, and that is where the emphasis is. You don't earn it or deserve it or merit it. You simply receive the kingdom the way a child receives. How does a child receive anything? Well, the answer is pretty simple, right? When you think about it, the child simply receives. That happens to be the way it is. To be a child is to be totally dependent. You simply receive. You're dependent. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is someone who, who, who knows that he or she is helpless and without any claim, without a me any merit whatsoever, and they simply receive the kingdom. That's why Jesus is so unbending and harsh in his interpretation of the law of God. Whether the subject is marriage and divorce, um, wealth or charity, piety or performance or, or whatever, he's got to make children out of us so that all we can do is receive without bargaining, without excuses, without righteousness of our own, without hope or, or earning or meriting or paying back. Children receive as dependents. It's all of us. We are all children. Children of God. Sometimes, though, when it comes to receiving what God has to offer to us in Jesus Christ, people have to be shown to kind of have their noses rubbed in it, if you will. If marriage and divorce or some of their area of family relations is the spot where you are vulnerable or to show how much you need what God has to offer, you know what? That's where the Lord is going to go and probe. That's where he's going to go stick you. If it's some other area, that's where he'll probe. He's going to stick in there and find it and probe in that, and it's going to hurt. Jesus didn't tell the rich young man to be faithful to his wife. He didn't answer the, question, the Pharisees' question about divorce by telling them to sell everything and give it to the poor. He probes right where it hurts for each of those scenarios. He knows that it's going to hit a nerve at those groups. 
Because only then, when it hits that nerve and it hurts, only then will we be in a position to receive. You know, when you go to the doctor for, for a broken arm, you suspect you got a broken arm, you go into the doctor's office, the doctor doesn't x-ray both your legs and send you home saying everything's going to be fine. Right? No, you get the broken arm fixed. If, if, if you suspect that's what it is, he probes it, right? He, he, he starts with discovering. He'll take your arm and he'll start touching it, right? He'll probe it. He'll take an x-ray look at it and he'll start, start touching it and, and feeling on it. And oftentimes that's pretty painful. It hurts. Where the problem is, and then you get to receive treatment. You receive the treatment that the doctor has to offer you the cure, maybe, if you want to say. You see, that's what the law does. And thinking back to your studies of Scripture and your studies back in Confirmation, that's what the law does. It probes. It digs into you a little bit. Sometimes pretty deeply. And we use the acronym SOS. The law shows us our sin. It readies us then to receive the cure. That cure is the same acronym again, acronym again, SOS. It shows us our Savior. The cure. What a wonderful cure that is. The Savior. Scripture spells it out. We see Jesus, the Jesus who suffered death for each and every one of us, who became one of us. Remember, at Christmas time, we say he's Emmanuel, God with us. He came and, and to be one like us and be with us. He didn't try to worm out of it when he, when he was condemned to death, right, as a sinner. And, and the one condemned to death, he tasted death for everyone then. He paid the price. The Son of God became like a child. He became our brother. His childness was demonstrated to be perfect through all of his suffering. The second lesson tells us, totally dependent on the will and the power and love of God, all the way to death. He died for our sins. For our sins in and out of marriage. For our sins with respect to money. For our sins with regard to slander and coveting and interpersonal relationships. And, and our sins with direct relationships to God himself. He became a child, our brother, to bring us as children to our heavenly father. He became our savior. We are shown our savior. That's the gospel at its core. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Cutting through all of the deception and getting right to the heart of the matter, Jesus tells us how it works. He's very clear here. You enter the kingdom of God by receiving it like a child. Whatever it takes to get you to that point, he's going to provide it. And even when it hurts... And even when it makes you squirm, whatever area you pick, Jesus is going to show you the problem. And Jesus is going to call it by its name, sin. And he's going to keep doing it until you finally cry out, uncle. Or better yet, you cry out, father. Father in heaven. Then, when that happens... You're ready to receive like a child the kingdom of God. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Jesus was so determined that we enter it that he laid his life on the line. To make it so, he became our brother so that you and I would become like children. We would then become children of God. Jesus didn't come into the world to abolish or destroy the law, but he came to fulfill the law for us. His coming into this world under the law and becoming sin before God in our place helps us answer that ultimate question, 
What must I do to inherit eternal life? Your eternal life comes when you receive it like a child. And Jesus is the one who makes that happen. He uses the law to show us our sin and ready us then to see him, the Savior, who gathers us into his arms and brings us into his kingdom. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all of our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We stand and sing our offer, offering him. We pray. Heavenly Father, creator of everything and worthy to receive the praise of all creation, hear the prayers of your creatures who by faith confess you as maker of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, give to the ministers of your church the guidance of your Holy Spirit that they may know how to speak to those in need of your rest. Bless our synodical president, our district president, and all pastors and workers in Christ, that through their faithful service we may hear your word and receive your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of all, grant your wisdom and guidance to the leaders of the nation, that your will may be accomplished throughout the world. Bless our nation's president, Congress, and judiciary, all federal and state authorities, and those who work to uphold justice, peace, and safety in our communities. Help us to be faithful citizens living according to the laws of the land and above all in obedience to your word. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, maker of all that is good and wholesome, we thank you for your creation and the preservation of holy marriage. Be with men and women who have been united in this honorable estate. Look with mercy on those whose union is troubled or under distress. Lead them to find help and hope in your loving grace and mercy. Lord, and your mercy. Lord and creator of all, you command to be fruitful and multiply, continues to be seen in all the blessings of children. Grant mothers and fathers the wisdom and energy to be faithful in their vocation as parents. Through careful instruction and loving nurture, create in their children the desire to love and honor those in authority. Protect all Christian children from danger and harm. Strengthen their precious faith established at baptism so that the children are attentive to hearing and learning the gospel and growing in the trust of their Savior. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord Jesus, for all those who have special concerns and needs this day, those who are hospitalized or shut in, facing surgery, recovering from surgery, those who are grieving, the unemployed and the underemployed, the chronically ill and all those whose needs are not known to us. Grant that we bring your blessings to situations of need in all places. Lord, in your mercy. As we bring our prayers to you, Lord Jesus, we remember the faithful Christians whose earthly lives have been completed and who now are in your eternal keeping. Help us to follow their examples of faith and faithfulness. And at last, reunite us with them in the joy of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. 
Lord God, in the Holy Supper, your Son, Jesus Christ, graciously invites us to feast on his most holy body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine for the forgiveness of sins, the strengthening of our faith, life, and salvation. Direct our hearts and minds toward his gracious sacrifice on the cross that we may worthily receive the benefits that this holy meal has to offer us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. These things and all else that we should have asked, grant to us your blessings for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Prepare us joyfully to remember our Redeemer and receive him who comes to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in Jesus' name and as he has taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated.
stand. And now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Peace be with you. Amen. We'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you have refreshed us with the body and blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that this heavenly food which we have received will strengthen our faith, that we may bear all crosses, sickness, and trials with patience, and trust until you grant us deliverance, peace, and health. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn. Again, good morning to all of you. It's great to have you here. As you go about your walk with the Lord this week, we remember that God calls sin a sin. It doesn't matter what it is or what we're talking about in our lives, sin is sin. And he is going to probe into your life. That's what the law does. It pokes you, makes you uncomfortable, but it readies you to receive that good news of Jesus Christ, that gospel message of Jesus so that you can enter the kingdom of heaven. Mr. Kirshner has a couple things to say. <laughs> 